been going through a little series about relationships, in particular the husband and wife relationship. But let me say, these principles can be used in, in about any area, any type of relationship. So I hope that uh, I hope that you will take note, and I hope these will be a help to you. Uh, they do come right from the Word of God, so you can't go wrong with that. Let's do a little review first, and uh, let's see here. Our first lesson, anybody remember what the first lesson was? I'll give you a hint, expectations. What do they do? Ruin relationships, that's right. When I have an expectation or I place expectations on my spouse or anybody else that only God can fulfill, then I set that relationship up for failure. Listen, our two most... Uh, uh, basic human needs emotionally are significance and security. And if I count on my spouse or a friend or a pastor or a teacher or whoever, mom, dad, to, to give me those two things to their fullest, they can't. They're only human, right? And so to expect my spouse to, be, to do something fully that only God can do, I set the relationship up for failure. So I need to learn to lean on Christ, lean on Christ. And if, if I can lean on my wife some, hey, that's bonus. And if she can lean on me some, and, and we should be able to, God made us one flesh, but ultimately I've got to lean on Christ. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I hope you understand what I'm saying. The second one was uh, provide a safe atmosphere. In the home especially, providing that atmosphere of unconditional love that, hey, no matter what happens, no matter what he or she does, no matter what he or she says, my love is going to be like God's love, the best. I'm going to give it that, my all to have that kind of love so that when they need me, I'm there. We, we ruin that when we say things. Oh, if I gave a for instance with one of my children or a couple of my children as they were my oldest two. I would say things like, uh, well, if I ever found you doing this, Here's what I would do. And I would say something extreme, thinking no, that fear will keep them from it. Or if I found out somebody ever got you to do this, I would find them, and this is what would happen. And I think, okay, yeah, that's going to scare the snot out of them there. They'll never do that. Well, here's the thing. When one of them did that, cross that line, and they needed to be able to come and talk to Dad, you think they did? No, I had not provided a safe atmosphere. They didn't until about a year later, and they said, I wanted to, to tell you a long time ago, but here's what I thought would happen. When we see somebody else's marriage falling apart or, or hear of somebody doing whatever, and then we say, well, if you ever do that, here's what I'm going to do. And, and we, give some, I mean, we give the extreme, the worst-case scenario, well, listen, when that person needs to talk to us, they're not going to. So I've sabotaged the relationship, and I didn't need to. We take these vows. In sickness is in health, in poverty is in wealth, for better, for worse, till death do us part. I, I'm, I'm making a covenant to you till death do us part. Now, for the Christian... That is a serious covenant we make before God. It's far beyond a commitment. It's a covenant. I'm giving myself to you and no other, for better or for worse. The third one was don't go with what? Don't go with your gut. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> Sometimes we'll get in a, a situation and we'll start making decisions when we're in an emotional time. Uh, whether that's anger, whether that's fear, whether that's heartache, and we'll say, well, here's what I think I need to do. I'm going to go with my gut or I'm going to go with my heart. Worst thing you can do is make big decisions during emotional times. Worst thing you can do. I've put some major decision making of my own on hold because going through emotional times, uh, my mom we know she only has a few months with us. And it's going to be a process of wasting away. That's difficult. 
my dad, every time I go back, his Alzheimer's is worse. As a pastor trying to help others with their burdens, and I, and I care. If I didn't care, it wouldn't be a burden to me, but I care. And so a lot of emotions going on, so I think, well, I need to make a decision here. Nope. I don't need to make a decision here right now. Because what I think, I'm following my heart or my gut, and I, especially if it's choosing between two rights, but I want to choose the best right, man, if it's an emotional time, I better just put all decision-making on hold. In our relationships, look, in every relationship, there's going to be volatile moments, uh, 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 precarious moments where, I mean, this whole relationship, whether that's uh, parent-child, whether it's husband-wife, whether it's a friend and friend, where, man, if we handle this wrong, this relationship is totally lost. One of the worst things we can do is make those decisions on our own in the midst of that, thinking we've got it figured out. The best thing we can do, put it on hold, get close to God, and seek godly counsel from people that you know. Hey, I really believe they walk with God. Get counsel from them and say, okay, I don't know that I agree with this advice, but I'm in a bad place right now. I'm in a bad state of mind. My mind and my heart, they're, they're probably seeing things uh, uh, through a faulty lens right now. I'm going to follow my counselors. I'm going to follow what the Word of God says. Don't go with your heart. Go with the Word of God. Okay, the, the next one. Can you what? Can you hear me now? I, I can, man, most of the marriages that I, I come in contact with and I, I, I try to help people, I don't know that I'm doing much good other than just being a friend and trying to love them, but most of the marriages I see falling apart aren't just falling apart. They've been falling apart until somebody got to the point where they say, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm done. Because for all these years, this was going on, and I tried to let you know what was going on. I tried to tell you my needs. I tried to tell you my heartaches, and you would not listen. So I'm gone. Can you hear me now? Children run away from home. Can you hear me now? Children take their own lives. Can you hear me now? And in that lesson we were teaching about, man, we need to take time not just to hear somebody's words, but to actually listen. What are they trying to tell me? What is it they're feeling in here? What is it they're thinking in here? Really hearing them. Last week, anybody remember last week's? Get your feet dirty. That's right. If you remember, we got that from the Song of Solomon where the wife, she's got cleaned up, she's taken off her house coat, she's gotten in bed, and, and her husband comes and he knocks on the door. My love, my dove. Isn't that what you men say to your wives? If you're gentle like that? My love, my dove. Come let me in. My hair is wet with the dew. I've been working all day. And here's what she said. Well, I've put my coat off. How will I put it on again? The same way you put it on the first time. What is it with these people? That's like somebody, um, uh, 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 a young lady told a young man recently uh, when she thought the relationship wasn't going well. They had been on two dates, I think, and the girl said to the guy, oh, I feel like there's something between us. I don't think I can live without you. And he said, well, you were living fine without me three weeks ago. You just go back, default to that. Well, I've taken my coat off. How will I put, uh, uh, how will I put it on? And, and, and if I get out of bed, I'll defile my feet. And so the husband reaches in at the hole of the door and he tries to get the latch. He can't get it. He gives up and he goes away. Then the wife says, oh, but I want, I want to spend time with him. She goes to the door. He's gone. And, and through many chapters after that, she's going through the city. As, Have you seen my beloved? She's describing him, I didn't let him in. You know what she did? She missed an opportunity. And in that we talked about the opportunities we have in relationships to minister to the other person and to strengthen that relationship. And we say this, oh, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. 
that old folk song, um, uh, what is uh, uh, The Cat's in the Cradle? You know what I'm talking about? Where the little boy says to the dad, hey, dad, can we throw ball? Can we go do something together? And he says, hey, son, we're, we're going to do it someday. I've got to go to work, but we'll, we'll get together then. And time passes and time passes and time passes until the young boy is now a young man. And he says, hey, dad, can I get the keys? And he says, hey, son, won't you sit down? Let's talk while let's spend a little time together. Dad, I'm in a hurry right now. We'll get together later. I'll be back home. We'll get together then. And the man says, I, I realized my boy had grown up to be just like me. Missed all those opportunities. An opportunity comes to build that relationship, seize it, because you don't know how long you'll have that relationship. Listen to me. Hey, kids, listen for a minute. You have an opportunity. You're still living at home. You have an opportunity to love your parents and to care for your parents. You better do it. Because they will not be here forever. And by the way, parents, you better do the same with those children. Pour your life into them. Spend time with them. Eat. Look, sir, I know what it's like. You go home, your war slap out. All you want to do is take a shower, kick your shoes, or kick your shoes off first. Uh, take a shower, get cleaned up, sit down in the recliner, just chill out for a minute. And your son says, hey, Dad, can we throw a ball? Can we go fishing? Can we do this? Can we go ride bikes? Can we go? Look, I know it's tiresome. Well, we better seize those opportunities. Don't let those opportunities slip by. Don't do like this lady. Hey, get out of bed. Get your feet dirty. Go spend some time with them. Now, here's the one for tonight. Boy, you're going to like this one here, okay? Relationships, be a bone breaker, okay? Here's the principle, be a bone breaker, all right? Some of you are like, oh, boy, I'm going to score high on this one. Turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 4. We're going to read a variety of verses here in Solomon, Song of Solomon. And at first you're going to wonder, where in the world does the bone breaking come in? That's what, I, that's what I'm all about, preacher. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Okay, first we're going to read verses 1 through 4. I'm going to skip around some verses. We do have children in here that aren't mature and I'm afraid would uh, get to laughing and stuff. So, behold, listen, now this is... The man speaking to, or speaking to his wife, okay? And by the way, Song of Solomon, it's a, it's a love song. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from washing. Okay, let me... Let me pause for here for here for a minute. In this day, these were all compliments, okay? I want you to realize that. If right now I looked at my wife and said, your hair reminds me of a flock of goats. I think she'd put rat poison in my supper. But in this time, these were amazing compliments, okay? Husband's a shepherd. The teeth are like a, I'm sorry, I'm going to start laughing. It's because I'm immature. The teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Look down in verse 7. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Look down in verse 9. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes and one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Now, li listen to what he's doing. This man 
is just complimenting his wife like crazy here at home. He's saying, boy, just one glance of your eye just sends my heart into turmoil. Just the, the smell of your clothing, just, just to look at you, just, uh, 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 you, your love, you just have such a pure love. Oh, my spouse, your love is better than wine. In verse number, or chapter 5, verse 2, we see the lady. Listen to some of the terms they use to each other. I sleep, but my heart waketh. This is her. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, and here's what he said. We looked at this verse last week. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. Do you see the terms, the, the sweet intimate terms of endearment he is using for her. Now look in Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 17. This is the lady now speaking to him. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? You hear what she's saying? She said, hey, honey, my beloved, the one whom my soul lo loves after, where, where will you have your flock at noontime? Where are you going to take a break so that I can come see you? I want to spend some time with you. Now, Proverbs 25. By the way, let me ask, is this kind of language typical in your home? Honey, you have goat's hair. Just want you to know, I mean it from my heart. When I say, are, are, is this language typical in your home, I don't mean these, necessarily these terms. I'm talking about the spirit of these terms. Words of tenderness, words of compassion and passion, words of sweet love and longing to be with each other. Not just spouse to spouse, but even, even parent to child and child to parent. I dare say that in the typical American home, even the typical American Christian home, this type, I'm not saying necessarily these exact words, but this spirit is something that's not normal anymore. You remember that show that used to come on TV, The Waltons? They'd go to sleep at night. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Billy Bob. Good night, Mom. Good night. And every one of them would tell every one of them, good night. So the longest part of the TV show was the credits before and after and them telling each other good night. You get 10 minutes of the story. Well, they're telling each other good night, good night, good night, good night. Is our home typified by this type of speech, this spirit of speech? Proverbs 25, look at verse 15. By long forbearing as a prince suaded, a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. What it's saying there is a, a, a soft word can soften even that which is most hard and obstinate and resistant in a person. A soft word. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 25, David sends his messengers to a, a man named Nabal. Nabal's shepherds had had his flock out in the wilderness and, and feeding them in different uh, areas. David's men, who were on the run from Saul, they protected those shepherds. They made sure that no wolves, no lions, no bears stole the sheep. They made sure that no body stole the sheep. They took care of those men, and now it's time for them to shear the sheep. They take them all back to Nabal and Abigail's place to shear the sheep, and David sends a messenger to Nabal and says, hey, listen, we, we helped your men. We were good to your men. We took care of them. You, you didn't lose a single sheep. 
could you spare some for us to eat? Well, Nabal was a, a churlish kind of guy. He said, absolutely not. Who do you think you are? You rabble rouser, you rebel. Why would I give you any meat? Man, that just gets David riled up. He said, how dare this man? We were good to him, and now he's going to be so rough with the people I sent to him. He's going to be so mean, so obstinate. Everybody saddle up and get your sword. So he's on his way now to kill Nabal, his family, his servants, and everything. One of the servants heard Nabal say this and went to Abigail and said, listen, our master has messed up. Here's what happened. Quickly, she got some food together, got some snacks together, some fruit, some meats. She saddled up and she said, let's go. And they went out to meet David and listen to the, and she falls down at David's feet. She gets on, falls at his feet and said, oh, my Lord, please, 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 don't do this. Don't do this. My husband, what he said, what that was wrong, but you have been, you've been an angel to us. And I know that God's hand is on you and God's going to bless you. I know you're God's chosen. And man, she just spoke the kindest words and diffused the situation. Listen to what David said in verse 32 through 34. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel which sent thee this day to meet me. Blessed be thy advice and blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal uh, by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. He said, listen, it's a good thing you came, and boy, you spoke these words. You, you, you got me in check because by tomorrow morning, everybody was going to be dead. How did she do that? With a soft word. We have the power of life and death in our tongue. Proverbs 18. Look over in Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. Verses 20 through 21. The Bible says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips he shall be filled. So what you say is going to determine what comes back at you, okay? Now look, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So in the power of the tongue is both death and life. Now let's apply that to our relationship with our children. With the power of my tongue, I can bring life to a relationship, or I can kill the relationship. With my wife, with my tongue, with the, the words I say, I can breathe life into a relationship or I can breathe death into a relationship. With your friends, the words we say with my employer, my employee, the words I say can either build that relationship or they can destroy that relationship. Why is it that when we are speaking to those that we love most, why do we feel that we ever have to use words of insult? I mean, okay. Words that build, words that tear down. Which one is the insult? Does the insult ever build a relationship? Help me out now. No, it never does. That insult, well, you're stupid, you're an idiot, you're a big mouth. No, that never builds the relationship. All it does is help to tear the relationship apart. That's all it does. And by the way, we're all guilty of it at some time or another, aren't we? We get angry, we get hurt, somebody takes a jab at us, somebody hurts us, we get fed up, and so the thing we do is, hey, you hurt me, I'm going to show you how it feels, buddy. And we hurl it right back to take a jab at them. Why do we, we feel like we have to use words, uh, uh, demeaning words, de words of diminishing? 
well, you're just stupid. You never do anything right. You're always wrong. Why do we use words that devalue somebody? Why would we ever tell one of our kids, no matter what they did, why would we say, you'll never amount to anything? Why would we say that, something like that, to our husband or to our wife, knowing that we have the power to breathe life or to breathe death with our words? Why would we ever say, you'll never amount to anything? Here's what happens. We say it long enough, that person believes it, and they resign to it. What we've done is we have executed death with our words. Why do we feel like we have to use words of hatred? Why would we ever say to someone that we love most, I hate you. I cannot stand you. Well, I didn't really mean it. No, the, the sad thing is we did mean it when we said it. I mean, let's just be honest. When we said it, we meant it at that time. And later we thought, boy, I shouldn't have said that. I don't mean it now. Why do we use these words of anger with those that we love most? Well, I was hurt. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was dis uh, disappointed. I was embarrassed. And I tried to talk to them. They wouldn't hear me. And, and listen, it's a soft tongue that breaketh the bone that breaks that which is most hard, most resistant, most obstinate in the person that we love most. It's that soft answer that does it. It's not that, that bless God, I'm going to break through it with my words that way. Every word we speak, we should ask ourselves, is this going to build or is it going to tear down? Come on, preach. Every word we speak, well, let me ask you, how important is your marriage to you? How important is your relationship with your children? How important is your relationship with your, your family members? If it's important enough, then yes, we better weigh every word because look, every word has the power of life or death in a relationship. I see relationships get strained, and, and, and the first thing people start doing, they get hurt, so they start firing back at each other. And all that does is make it escalate, and it creates the bigger divide. It creates resentment. And let me tell you something. Some of those words, though time heals all wounds, it does leave scars, and some of those words are never forgotten. They may be forgiven, but some of those words are never forgotten. We say things like, I hate you, I can't stand you, you're stupid, you always do this. You never do this. You're not a real man. Well, you're just uh, whatever. What, words of comparison, why can't you be more like his wife? Why can't you be more like her husband. Why can't you be more like their children? Why can't you be more like their parents? Well, when we do this, you know what? You're just like your mama. You're just like your daddy. That's what I'm talking about. Now, let me tell you something. Those words only make the heart harder. Those things only build anger, resentment, cynicism. That's all that does. But imagine if you handled it this way. Imagine if in the home you checked yourself and you started saying things like, honey, I know I've upset you. I want you to know I love you. I, I apologize for disappointing you. What are you, crazy? No, I, I may be. I may be. And if I am, I'm crazy in love with you. Oh, you see what I did there? 
What if in, in, instead of having uh, hurling insulting words, we went back to telling our wife how beautiful they were? Oh, preacher, have you looked at mine lately? No, 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 no. Now look, the fact she puts up with you makes her a beautiful person. Okay? What, what would happen if we went back to ladies telling their husbands how handsome they look? When you're talking about how big their muscles are, don't rub their stomach while saying that. Oh, you have such big muscles. <laughs> what if we went back to things like, oh, you're such a hard worker. Thank you for being such a hard worker and providing for this family. Hey, thank you for being such a, a good mom to these kids. Thank you for being a good wife. Thank you for putting up with me. I know I'm not the easiest person. Hey, I know I'm not the easiest person to live with. My feet stink. Okay. <laughs> she said, not as bad as Lance's. Amen. I know Lance gets home in, while he's still in the driveway. If he takes his shoe off, I know he's home. What if we went back? Remember how we spoke to each other when we were dating? I guess most, I don't know, maybe, maybe you were that way when you're dating. I don't know. But remember when we were trying to win their affection? What if we took it as our personal, our personal mission to build our wife, to build our husband, to build our children? And I'm not saying that we would be perfect at it, but what if that was my mission as a parent, my mission as a spouse was, you know what? I know they have faults. I know they have problems. So do I. I'm going to do my best with my words to create life in them. Those harsh words we use, man, those do a whole lot to just tear a person down. And we contribute not to the answer, we contribute to the problem when we use those kind of words. Now this seems like common sense, doesn't it? Oh yeah, oh, we should talk nice to each other, that seems like common sense. But it's so easy to fall into this trap, into this trap of destructive speech that creates a hard, cold relationship rather than using speech that creates a softness and a tenderness and an intimacy in the relationship. So how do we do this, okay? Check this out, Luke 6, 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his, what? Heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Those negative things we say it's, and those destructive things we say, it's because our heart is full of negative things and destructive things. It's full of anger, it's full of bitterness, it's full of malice, it's full of all those things. So I've got to get my heart straight. How about this verse here? Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinketh in his what? Heart, so is he. One reason we, we get so full of the negative things is because that's all we think about. We don't pause to just take time to do what we did, remembering here what the Lord did for us, to think about the good in our spouse, in our child, in our parents. Preacher, well, you don't understand with this one of mine, there's so much negative. You may have to help me out with this verse because I get, it, I get the words mixed up. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, is it honest? Uh, there's a bunch of good stuff in there uh, of good report, um, whatsoever things are What's something else? Uh, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, it says to think on these things. So here's what I do. My wife, take time to think about that lady that's been faithful to me. That lady's a hard worker. That lady loves God. I think on those positive things. And I fill my heart with those positive things so that my speech doesn't cause her heart to be hardened, but 
causes it to be solved. And I think about my children and how much I love them and how that they are a gift of God to me. And I feel in my heart, you've, you've heard the computer term garbage in, garbage out. If I'm putting garbage in, that's what's going to come out. So I need to put something good in. I feel my mind and my heart with how much I love my children so that when they do something that disappoints or do something that frustrates or embarrasses, and boy, that's going to happen, right? The words that come out, even in discipline, are words that build and not destroy. So the Bible said there, or, or what? Yeah, the Bible said, what's, what's my verse there? Uh, Proverbs 25, 15, a soft tongue breaketh the bone. It breaks that which is most hard, obstinate, and resistant in a person, a soft tongue. And we'll read a couple more verses that we already read. Listen to this type of speech, and I want you to not listen to this, the words, but the spirit behind it. Song, Song of Solomon 4, 1, behold, this is him talking to her, thou art fair, my saying you're beautiful behold thou art fair listen to what she says Psalm, or Psalm of Solomon 117 tell me O thou whom my soul loveth where thou feedest where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon tell me where you're going to be where you're going to eat I want to spend some time with you your marriage does not have to fall apart and you do not have to end up estranged from your children or from your parents if you will use words that, I'm sorry, that's the notification thing that went off my head. If you will use words that will build the relationship and not tear it down. So be a bone breaker. Use soft words to break up the things that are hold, hard, resistant, and obstinate in that relationship. Father, thank you.